Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. And look who my special guest is this week, none other than Apostate Alex. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Thanks for having me, Tony. You bet, Alex. You know, um, you sent me a piece some time ago so we could introduce you to the readers, and they got a sense that you, you're not only fairly fresh out of Scientology, but you were a staffer in London, which is a very unique uh, situation for somebody coming out of Scientology. And I'm so glad you're over there. You've been very active. But the reason why I wanted to talk to you this week is that we have this amazing event coming up, which is really catching uh, some attention and some media. Please tell us a little bit about how you came up with this idea for a protest at the IAS event and how it's going so far. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you um, because you've been a big supporter of mine and given me the chance to write a piece about my story and then sharing all the stuff I've been doing. You know, it's it's really important that um, this organization is spoken about and you've been doing this for a long time. And I think the fact that you've been so willing to support new people to the scene like me and share the message and um you know it, it means a lot and i just want to say thank you for that because um without people like you fighting the fight for years gone by well, i wouldn't and people like me wouldn't have the opportunity to speak out like we currently do so thank you firstly well it's a very it's a very different scene i'm glad that it's different i mean back in the day there were fewer people because it was terrifying and they were hammering all of us and now there's just so many people speaking out I don't think OSA has the uh, resources to go after everyone. And so it's it's a great situation where people can come out, tell their story, relate to each other. Uh, and so we get, you know, people like you that have a unique perspective and, uh, you know, really interesting. You know, some interesting people. That's what I love <laughs> so much, Alex. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think also, you know, if you look at the how the landscape has changed, um, it's I would ne if I had been in Scientology and left and done what I did now 10 years ago, I would never in a million years have considered organizing a protest and doing what I'm doing now because the landscape is different and they would have come after me in a different way and more viciously. I think it's allowed things like this to happen. Um, and to answer your question, the IES event, International Association of Scientologists, is happening next week. I don't know how much the people listening to this or watching this are going to know from what we've read already so i'll just very quickly um recap big event happening at saint hill um east grinstead the headquarters in the uk next week dave miscavige is going to be hosting it um and i basically came across someone an insider sent me um about four weeks ago the um promotional poster that had been sent to a bunch of scientologists and said hey alex you know this has just come out so within 25 minutes of receiving it i wanted to get it out there because part of what i'm doing is i really want to show osa that we are really proactive and really reactive and very quick to act on news and get stuff out there um so i instantly posted it on twitter and shared it with you and as many people as i could um and i just thought wow this is huge the first time an event is happening in the uk for four years um David Miscavige is undoubtedly going to be there because there wouldn't be an IAS event with a big tent and thousands of people coming if he wasn't here in person. Um, and I just was interested in the story. So followed it a little bit and very quickly came to the decision in my mind. It was almost like I didn't need to think about it. It was like, obviously, I have to go there and protest and make my voice heard because I've never protested at Scientology before. And there's so much, um, what's the word? There's so much gravity, I suppose, attached to this particular event. Um, it's pivotal. And I wanted to make a bit of a statement that we're here. And if you're going to make a big, bold statement about how you're here and still leading Scientology, we're going to do the same about how we oppose Scientology. Um, so, yeah, just started thinking, OK, what does this look like? And um, just going through the process and seeing what the interest was like and very quickly um, realized there was a lot of support online for people who wanted to watch it digitally on the stream or in the UK show up in person. So quickly made a website which is iesprotest.com outlining the details and then got to work um, on the plans and the details of what, what we're going to do. Right. And um, well, 
I definitely want to hook up with you about that because I want to, I, I think people at the bunker are going to be really interested to watch what's going on as it's going on. So we'll, I want to talk to you later about some details about that. Um, let me just, let, let's just do a little reminiscing here for, uh, for a second, because there may be some people who aren't entirely familiar with what we're talking about as far as the IAS, but, um, you know, it really goes back to these two lawsuits in the mid eighties. I don't know how much you researched this, but Scientology had these two lawsuits that really scared the crap out of them, crap out of them. One in Los Angeles, a man named Lawrence Wollersheim was suing Scientology. And in Portland, Oregon, uh, a woman named Tichborn uh, Christofferson. What was her first name? I'm forgetting all of a sudden. Anyway. I don't know. I know the Wollersheim case, but I don't know the other one. Yeah. Well, the reason why these lawsuits were so bad and why they scared Scientology was that both of them were, were not suing over the Sea Org. They weren't suing over financial extortion. They were suing over the technology. They were both saying this stuff is harmful. Auditing is harmful. And Scientology made the mistake of allowing both of them to actually go to trial. So a jury got to hear what Scientology is all about. And they both made $30 million awards. Now, Scientology managed to, uh, they really swarmed the Portland courthouse, scared the crap out of the judge. He blinked. And they basically killed that one. She got just like a little tiny award. Wollersheim, on appeal, they managed to get it down to $2 million, But then they, they spent so many years not paying it that eventually the interest brought it back up to $9 million and they paid that. That was in 2002. I, I was covering that. So that's what was so scary about those lawsuits. Wasn't you know some something like uh, we see today with uh, Leah's retaliation lawsuit or we see with Valeska's, you know, Sea Org uh, abuse lawsuit. Those are terrible. But what really scared them was the idea that an ex-Scientologist could sue over auditing. Because imagine how the floodgates would open if that was, you know. So that was the impetus for a defense fund. They said, we got, you know, we got we to gotta be ready for this. And so I think there were a couple of different versions. And eventually this thing grew up called the International Association of Scientologists right around that time in the mid eighties and it, it became the, the membership organization. And the idea was you're going to pay $50,000 to be a lifetime member, which, you know, I think before that, I mean, this was after Hubbard. There's nothing in Hubbard that said you, you should do something like that. What Hubbard wanted you to do was buy a book, learn to audit and make other auditors. That's it. Right. And now suddenly you're supposed to give them these tons of money and that's what it's become over the years, these gigantic donations, billions of dollars. And so each year in October, they would come out to England to celebrate the biggest donors under this tent at the IAS Gala. And I can tell you for several years there, I really enjoyed it because I got some videos leaked and uh, we would get to identify the whales because they'd put them out with their trophies in Impact Magazine. But I wanted to know, did you, as a staffer in London, did you get to go? And what was the gala like for you? So I have a really interesting, I think it's quite cathartic and an interesting story arc with the IES. Because um, in short, I've never been to an IES event in person at St. Hill but I've been to events that we held in London a week after with locals when we play the video. Um, and the reason I haven't been to one in St. Hill, I mean, my first encounter with an IES event was when I first joined staff, I was in Scientology for less than a year. Um, and essentially um, I was, I'd just left staff because I had to go back to school and we were trying to handle uh, my family on trying to be okay with me leaving school early to continue my time on staff. And there was this whole plan that I would bring my mum to the IES event in October as a kind of, because she'd been to the org a couple of times, but kind of as part of the program of look at how great we are, not trying to convert her into a Scientologist, but getting her to be okay with me spending my life doing this and not finishing my education. And I got a call from Mark Pinchin, the DSA, Director of Special Affairs at London, 
the night before the event and I'd booked the day off school and my mum had booked the day off work um, and it was like 10 o'clock at night or something and he called me up and said Alex um, you can't come to the IS event because you have a connection to an enemy of the church and this whole the principle was very new to me because I was only I'd only been in Scientology for like less than a year at this point. Um, and what had transpired was my mum doing research out of concern for me, had heard of like a colleague, had a friend who had a family member or something who had a negative experience. And they suggested, would you like me to put you in touch with this person? And my mum said, yeah, that, you know, sounds great. OK. Um, and they never actually met up, but that was enough of a connection for me to be banned from going to this event. So it's I kind of love the fact that that was my first interaction with IES. And now here we are, however many years later, and I'm going to be outside protesting the IES. I just I love that as a story. Well, and there's been some famous protests before. Um, you know, I, I know some of the folks there in England that would go out there and, uh, you know, hold signs and things. And they've been some funny showdowns and stuff like that. Uh, um, you know, are you expecting what, you know, I guess, I guess it's hard to know what you're going to run into at this point. Yeah. I think the interest has been huge to begin with. I mean, when I say huge, I mean, in Scientology terms, anti-Scientology is not, we're not talking millions of people. We're talking, you know, dozens or, you know, under a hundred people is the almost instant response that I got, which, oh, which massively was more than I thought. I thought I'd get, you know, five people or something. Because if you look at previous protests, there's been five, 10, maybe 20 maximum people at these things. And overnight, I had something like 30 registrations of people saying, hey, I want to attend and please send me more information. Um, so I need I wanted to get an idea of numbers. And I thought, wow, this has the potential to be something quite large. Did some research and found out the last time more than about 20 people protested Scientology in the UK was the anonymous movement 15 years ago. So I thought, well, actually, if I can get 25 people there, it will quite easily be the largest anti-Scientology protest in recent history. So I thought that's quite interesting and um, and a good thing to do. So just went down that rabbit hole and I thought, okay, let's do this properly. You know, I work in marketing and events outside of my Scientology stuff. So I'm very akin to organizing things like this, not protest, but negotiating with different authorities and permissions and this. Um, so instantly contacted the council, uh, the local authority, to ask for permission to close the roads in East Grinstead and the road that St. Hill is actually on and said, hi, I'd like to do a protest march. Can we close the roads for a couple of hours? Um, and it was against the Scientology event. And their response was, what Scientology event? <laughs> And now they have permission to host events up to 7,000 people, according to their premises license at St. Hill. But one of the conditions is they have to inform the authorities six weeks beforehand so mm. they can do checks on health and safety and child protection, this sort of thing. Um, and it turns out that they hadn't done that. So, of course, my application for road closure was prior to their notice that the event's even happening. So I've kind of got priority in some sense um but also there's Ooh. five thousand people potentially showing up so realistically safety wise that might take precedence so we're in the last little bits of negotiation about um the actual times and potential road closures and i should know by monday um what the situation with the march is going to be but that's fantastic i love the idea that you have the uh the the the, the prime spot because you you called before they did. Um, well, when five when you say five thousand, now this was another fun thing about the IS events until they stopped happening in you know the, the 2015, 16, 17, was that they would then put out photos, and there are some underground bunker readers who are very good at well, they're very dedicated. They will go through and count heads. I mean, they'll count individual little heads in a big picture, and you know, they're Scientology is very good at using these wide angle lenses to make a crowd look much bigger than it actually is. And when they say they say 5,000 people showed up, that means 1,500 did. I, I don't think they've ever had those gigantic crowds, at least in, in the last few years, that they claim. But we'll see. Maybe they'll maybe they can fill it this time. I don't know. 
Um, I think according to reports from the last IES event, and again, this is just based on people who were protesting then, I wasn't there. Um, someone did a count of all the coaches that were going it because Scientologists travel by coach to arrive that's sent from the local orgs. Um, and they estimated based on, you know, how roughly how full, filled the coaches were and how many, about three and a half thousand people okay. were at the last one. Um, but who knows? That's an estimate. It could be much less or, or, or more. I think for this one, they haven't said 5,000. That's kind of an estimation that I've come up with because that's, well, that's the capacity of the tent that they've got. Um, so maximum, I think it will be less, but it, there is potential for it to be a higher attended event than normal because there's so much riding on it. And it's such a big moment in recent Scientology history. There hasn't been an event in four years. Dave Miscavige is rarely seen the events in Clearwater and in LA, like the new year's Eve event, um, a much smaller capacity, just the U S this is the first time the leader of the church is coming to Europe, has stepped foot outside of the US, as far as we know, in four years. So I think there's a there's going to be a lot of people wanting to go and making special efforts to be there if they can. So I, I'm expecting I, I to be a well I think you're right about that. But I yeah. think on the other hand, it feels very last minute. I mean, when you've got Sandrine out there on her videos, which you've been helping me get hold of, um, you know, she, there's it's fun. I mean, there's no question they're having a little fun trying to whip up further, but there's also a little sense of desperation. Like we know that you're only hearing about this now because, you know, Scientologists, they have to put their lives on hold. They have to, you know, because a lot of people are going to have to come from places like the U.S. That's a lot of flights. That's a lot of businesses put on hold. So I don't know. It feels kind of last minute to me now that, you know, they, he still may get a big crowd, but I would think that, um, well, it'll be interesting to see. If, I hope we can get some sense of it. And I hope they publish photos, you know? Yeah, well, all of the hotels and Airbnbs within about a 30-mile radius are, are completely fully booked. So I imagine there's maybe other events going on because it's, you know, the bonfire night weekend. So it's not going to be entirely Scientology. But I had a look as soon as I saw the poster and there was a lot of space available and a couple of days later, they were all gone pretty much. So we could probably do a bit of maths and work out what the capacity is and how many rooms have been booked roughly to get an idea. Um, that might be an interesting, you know, equation to work out. Um, and yeah, of course we'll, we'll do a rough estimation based on what we see. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be 5,000, but, We'll see, I suppose. Well, they'll say it is. Yeah. And then they'll have nice angles that we won't be able to count the entire room at one time. But uh, yeah. But no, I also it... wonder what you were. Sorry, I was just going to say something about the Sandrine thing was um, it does seem desperate that they haven't posted on social for a long time and suddenly they're posting lots to try and get. And it's, it's happening globally. I saw a thing today from the one of the orgs in France um, doing the same thing, like coming to the IS event and the London org was sharing it. So I think there's been a bit of maybe direction or encouragement from management to get the word out there publicly. Um because it's not just London that are promoting it on social. So I wonder if maybe um an element is the bold statement the Scientology is still here. It's still expanding and they want it to be known that they're still here and doing this big event rather than perhaps trying to use social media to attract Scientologists to sign up. It could be a mixture of both. Um, but I wonder well, if they're almost doing it just as a, a public statement. Well, let let yeah. me ask you, because you were there at the time. I mean, um, the other, the American orgs are just pitiful at any kind of public outreach or social media. And I noticed, I don't know, six, seven years ago, it's been quite a while now, that this London org had these younger staffers and they were making videos, they were uh, posting a lot of photos, they they actually, you know, um, took Charlie Wackley and Sandrine Mutu and made them sort of a dynamic duo to sort of represent the org. I mean, it definitely felt like there was some planning here. There was some sort of idea. Let's let's give the London org this fresh look and everything. You were there at the time. Can you tell me what where that was coming from? I absolutely can because it was my idea. <laughs> um, when I was on staff um, initially, 
um, as when, no, not initially. When I was on staff, about 2013, director of public book sales, everyone at London at the time and probably still are very young and hip. It does have a different feel to other rules, so I gather anyway. And I came in, I was like, look, guys, why don't we use social media to sell books? Because my job is to sell books. You know, social media is a great platform. We should post stuff just like, you know, trying to sell Dianetics. Um, and Charlie loved the idea and basically made it clear that if we ask for permission to do this, it will almost definitely be denied because OSA want complete control over it. So I think we should just do it. And it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, so do it, but make sure it works because if when they find out they come down and say what are you doing stop that and we can say well actually it's a beneficial book selling action they don't have a leg to stand on because it's a suppressive act to stop any successful book action so do it but make sure it works because it's high risk so that's how it started was just i created a facebook page dianetics london posting l ron hubbard quotes and pictures and success stories all stuff that was kind of public or pre-approved kind of on the website stuff anyway so it's kind of less risky um and that started the process and then i left scientology and it just grew and grew and grew from there. And that's when Sandrine started on staff and then started appearing on Instagram and was Charlie's new best mate. Um, and it seemed to, they seemed to have upped the level of the quality and the quantity. And I, my suspicion is they had a chat with international management and they said, look, this is kind of working. And they must have done some sort of pilot where they said, okay, great. Here's some money or here's some ideas, do this way, some direction, go for it and let's see how it works. And then it just grew from there. And then we have other orgs doing the same thing now. Um, that's my suspicion of how it all started. And uh, you were pretty close to Charlie Wackley at one point. He was my best mate. Wow. Yeah. And I live about 15 minutes from him. <laughs> Yeah. And that whole family's in real deep, right? Fascinating family. I've learned so much about them since leaving that I didn't know when I was on staff. You know, there are stories about Charlie's dad that have been reported before that I won't get into here that I was like, wow, okay, I had no idea that this family was so close to central management. Um, one person told me because he was there at the time that Charlie's dad, Nick, is one of uh, only a handful of British Scientologists who have personally been beaten up by David Miscavige. Wow. And what I mean, I don't have evidence other than this eyewitness account, but this is something like, wow, that's only going to happen if you're important and close to uh, COB himself. And yes, the whole family are, are totally in. Charlie's a third generation Scientologist. So are his two brothers, Matt and Jason. Jason is an ethics officer, or was. He's now joined the Sea Org and is over at LA. Um, Matt at the time was a core suit when I was there. He's still on staff, not sure of his post at the moment. Um, his mum, Natalie, Nat, she used to come out book selling with us every week. We had a really good like connection. She ended up joining staff just before I left and is still there. Um, they are huge donors to Scientology, so they're really important um, financially. And I think this is something that's really common in Scientology London, but not necessarily the other orgs, I don't know. The majority of staff members, especially when I was there, were second or third gen Scientologists whose families are big whales um, and are funding Scientology. There's like a handful of big families that contribute a lot. The Cauciolis, the Lysets, the, um, uh, the Gaiman family who married into the Cauciolis, the Miltons, and obviously the Wackleys. So I wonder if that's why London got away with a lot more, because uh -huh. yes, they're staff members, but they kind of don't want to step on too many toes because they're also hugely important to the funding of Scientology. Without those few families, there wouldn't be any money in Scientology in the UK. So I wonder if that's kind of, kind of came into play um, at, at the time. And since you brought it up, um... Can you tell me when you were there, what sense did you have of the Gaiman family, David in particular, um, Neil? Uh, what did you, did you ever hear anything about Neil? 
um, Neil's mom, uh, who's still around, I think, and still donating. What what sort of talk did you hear about all of them when you were on staff? So I didn't know who they were in terms of fame, you know, with the um, books and, you know, the like, you know, success as a celebrity status. But I knew the name is hugely important. Sheila Gaiman um, is still around. Yes, her she has a business called G&G Food Supplies and Vitamins, which is what G&G Vitamins Um and they supply all of the vitamins to all of the orgs in the UK. Um, and so we know that they're important that way. Um, but then I didn't realize till after that the Calcioli family who married in, um, you know, Lizzie Calcioli um, now runs G&G Vitamins um, and Ali Calcioli, like all the three boys in the Calcioli family are all staff at London Org. Um, so again, hugely important. Their business is profiting off sales of vitamins to their church and they're also donating to the church at the same time and working for the church and then there's links as well like you know Ali Calcioli got married to Louisa Hodkin with the first Scientology wedding in the UK and that ties them into Peter Hodkin the UK lawyer so you've got these like three big families that have all come together in a fat like in one family also working for the church that's what I mean it's all very tight-knit at London Org. And for those American uh, viewers who are puzzling over your reference to the first Scientology wedding in England, England has different ideas about wedding laws than the United States of America, where, you know, in the U.S., you know, you can get married in scuba gear at the bottom of a pool. I mean, it's just like we just we we have almost no rules whatsoever. But in England, because uh, there is an official church. There are rules about what constitutes an official church wedding in that country, and Scientology forever had been trying to appeal to the higher courts to say that Scientology is a legitimate religion, we should be able to have a church wedding in Scientology, and England said no. You know, of course, the United States, the, the U.S. would never even, that would not be an issue at all. You can, like I said, get married anywhere. But then finally, the court did change its mind and decide that um i remember john atac was furious um that scientology could have official weddings and so you're right they had that first official scientology church wedding we wrote about it that day it was um alessandro caccioli who goes by ali and he married louisa hodkin she's the daughter of this famous attorney there and um yeah i mean scientology milked that versus uh, publicity at the time were you were, were you at the org i was that there way? yeah yeah i was on staff and i knew ali and louisa i worked with both of them in the org and i remember that process um leading up to the decision and i think it's really important that um to understand for perhaps american um listeners and viewers who aren't familiar with uk law we don't have like a constitution right because our laws are so archaic our constitution if you like is just kind of made up of a collection of laws that date back a thousand years that have changed and been repealed and whatever so there are everything in british law is so um specific and convoluted um, it's not like one simple decision is like, okay, you're a religion now and can do weddings and all of this. It's like lots of little victories lead up to that. Mm -hmm. And one of those is the um, religious wedding ceremonies. And part of that whole court case um, resulted in the definition of religion being changed in British law, because the case essentially was made that the law was so outdated and the definition of religion, you know, meant you had to believe in a supreme being and there's lots of new religions that have started and it doesn't allow for Buddhism, for example. So that was their challenge was that the law was archaic and therefore needs to be changed. And as a result of that, Scientology, therefore, can be classed as a religion for wedding. Well, and purposes. I remember at the time, the thing that got hung up on time and time again since the 70s was that the British law was that the church where you're going to have a religious wedding has to be a place of worship. Mm -hmm. Now is a Scientology org, a place of worship. Of course, those of us who study it from the outside say, absolutely not. There's no worshiping in Scientology. In fact, Scientologists themselves would tell you that it's a science, you know, 
but uh, religious cloaking and all that. So they finally got that past that. I can't remember exactly what argument they made, but I think I think the court relaxed the idea, the definition of the word worship. Like, you know, initially there has to be the supreme being and you're on your knees and you're praying to them, right? No, I think we can have a larger definition of what worship is. So trying to figure out what your Thetan was doing a billion years on another planet, that's sort of like worship, right? So uh, whatever it was, they relaxed that definition and that's what allowed the change in the law. And uh, so, you know, I, at the time it was happening, I was trying to remind people that this guy getting married in the first religious wedding in Scientology history in England is Neil Gaiman's nephew. I just love pointing out the Neil Gaiman thing because, I, look, I, you know, some people think I'm uh, too easy on him, but there's no question the guy was heavily involved. He got into the OT levels. I've heard reports that he was ED at Birmingham. I've never... Yes. I've never totally confirmed that. If you think he was, he was. Okay, so he was he was ED at Birmingham, and he was in the OTs. So, you know, very, very involved in Scientology. And um, he, but he doesn't talk about, he rarely talks about it today. But then I don't, I, I can understand why. He's got, his mom, Sheila, is still giving millions of dollars. His sister, Lizzie Calcioli, is, you know, very involved. And then he's got another sister who's in LA in the Sea Org, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The family, the family history is really interesting. And I'm just learning more and more about it because when you're in Scientology working in the York, you know, the people you get to know them and you become friends, but you never really think to ask too much about everyone's history. You know, how, you know, if you say, how long have you been in Scientology? You're like, oh, I was raised in it. Okay, great. You know, I never really delved into these sort of specifics of your grandfather did what and this and because we were so focused on production all of the time um and it was conversations that were important and linked to post and you have little chit chat here and there so i i got an understanding of the lay of the land but yeah it's been fascinating to learn a lot more about this and yeah i think there's so much to learn about that family you know there are reports that i think it was david gaiman was um in osa or was like working in osa or maybe it was neil well, one he of them. was guardian's office he was an unindicted yes. co-conspirator in snow white yeah exactly and this is stuff that happened many years ago but that family is still involved in working and running the church in london and that history really plays a part in their activities i think and the way they approach things now so um another thing i'm thinking about with the protests you're getting some good media you were in the guardian this week um and it looks like it's getting picked up by some others have you thought about okay the day of now that now that you're getting that kind of coverage the day of you're likely to get some reporters out there have you thought about your message and what are some of the things, because I know you, you're very, you know, you're a good marketer. You're very good at, at encapsulating things. Um, have you thought about the kind of messages you want these reporters to, to get that day? Yeah, absolutely. I think firstly, um, everyone is entitled to their own voice and that everyone will have their own message that they want to convey personally. So I don't want to do anything to uh, try and control the narrative or anything like this. I think, freedom of speech and the whole fact that this is an opportunity for people to have their voice heard is really important. Um, I think the overall message that I'm trying to convey with the protest as a whole is twofold. Number one, um, the abuse must stop, right? It's not attacking Scientology beliefs or people who believe in it, but currently there is harassment and abuse going on globally at every level and that in itself is not okay so that's a strong message that needs to stop um and secondly help is available there's a whole support community and network out here um for anyone that does decide to leave and i think that those two things will attack or, or get the attention of the church itself and also the people inside because Things like, and this is the sort of thing we're going to have on our placards and on our banners. Um, you know, did you know that David Miscavige is named as a defendant in a human trafficking case and has been trying to avoid service? If he's innocent, why is he running? Why doesn't he just confront it, right? Like a good Scientologist. Um, and things like this that I'm hoping Scientologists that are going to the event will see and just kind of, it will start, the, it will make them think, huh. I didn't know that, or that's getting me thinking, you know, 
and a, que- a question is like, when was the last time you saw your family? I'm not expecting anyone to see our protests and then go, I'm leaving, I'm not going to this event, but I just want to plant some seeds and get these people to see some messages they perhaps haven't seen before, educating them on what's going on um, and getting them to start thinking because historically a lot of the protests have been a message of you're a cult, you believe in Xenu, it's all about the money. And as a Scientologist myself, having witnessed and um, received a lot of that stuff when I was in, it, you just close close off to that stuff and you think, oh, they're just SPs, you know, I'm not going to listen to them. But if the message is one of compassion and education and maybe getting people to think, I think that will have a more um, impact, like a bigger impact on the Scientologists themselves in a, on the longer term. I think a fun one to ask Scientologist is, is David Miscavige a Scientologist? Um, when was the last time he got auditing? And if it's been more than 30 years, why? You know, that's a great question. Someone suggested we're going to have some fun as well. Someone suggested the other day that we should have a chant or a sign that says HMP, not SMP. So HMP is His Majesty's Prison and SMP is Scientology Media Productions, <laughs> which I thought was quite a funny chant HMP, not SMP. So we'll have some fun with it as well. But yeah, I mean, traditionally, there's been some great stories that come out of that. I mean, um, when you talk about compassion, I immediately think about Tori Chrisman and Andreas Heldalun. And Andreas, you know, I know you're he's um, going through a really tough time right now. Um, but, you know, that that was that story was uh, Tori's job was to go her volunteer job was to go online and, and fight with the critics of Scientology, who assume she assumed would be these angry people chanting about Xenu and all that stuff. And then Andreas was just reached out to her to try to help her format her answers a little bit more clearly. And he was helpful. And that just shocked the hell out of her because here's the guy that runs Xenu.net is probably the biggest Satan on earth. And he was being friendly and that just really caught her by surprise and got her thinking. And that is the number one thing. If you can get a Scientologist thinking, uh uh-oh, because so much of the time they don't think, right? Yeah, I think another thing I was thinking of is like trying to make them smile, maybe have a sign that says something like, you know, we we might be SPs, but we just want you to be happy. Or, ha, see, made you smile. And things that they'll kind of look at and they'll kind of smile. And then they'll start thinking about it like, oh, actually, hold on. <laughs> These SPs are actually not necessarily what we've been told. Yeah, little things like that. Um, And I think that's the message to current Scientologists. And I think the message that the press probably will be more interested in is the message of the abuse must stop. Um, And so that's one of the messages that we're going to carry of harassment is going on, the human trafficking lawsuit, um, and kind of just stating some facts um, and sending a clear message to chairman of the board that um, he, he is not welcome in this country if he is doing these things or responsible for these things a number of people have reached out to me personally and expressed that they are um they are surprised at the audacity of someone who has um all of these allegations that is being made against him he's been on the run he's been in hiding and then he uses u.s taxpayer money to live a life of luxury and hop on a private jet to the uk for a little holiday and then stand on a stage in front of thousands of people um and say how great and wonderful he is and then leave a few days later um a lot of locals in east grinstead and just general population are really upset and angered by that. And I think quite rightfully so. It's a, it's a bold move and it's not a good message uh, for him to be conveying. It's, it's the kind of message that works on Scientologists, although sometimes I wonder how taken in they are. But then if you take that message out, that's what I always enjoyed is when we'd get a video or I got leaked audio and we get the transcript and actually look, look at what he's saying. It's just like, how does anybody buy any of this? It's just so obviously inflated and uh, I don't know. You must have, I, did you have doubts at all when you would hear these um, uh, expansion claims when you were at the staff? 
Absolutely, because there was a time, goal, Rachel Hastings, who just started speaking out from Goal, she was a film director, she, um, there was a time I didn't realise, we, we did an interview the other day and we realised on live that we'd crossed paths and met in London and she told me the story, she'd been sent by COB directly to come to London to film me and my team in Div 6 because we were known for doing so well at book selling and they came and did this film shoot, I've talked to this story before of how they came and I was a bit annoyed that they were getting in the way and so on but basically the Tottenham Court Road Centre was empty there were a couple of people coming in but that's the reality of it because yes we're selling lots of books but we're talking 200 a week right we're not talking thousands so it's never going to be filled up it's a huge space that's always going to be empty and so I had to run to the park next door to go and ask people say hey guys we're making a film you know can we borrow you for 10 minutes you can be an extra we have to do is sit there and they were like yeah okay so we got some people in sat them down got a shot of them watching the public information center and they said thank you so much guys enjoy the rest of your lunch break and so i knew when i saw that footage at the event that the images are all manufactured because i was there but it didn't impact my thinking because although i was like okay take it all with a pinch of salt in a way it almost didn't matter the truth of the numbers or how much it was inflated because for me it was more important the sentiment that look we're trying and this is an ideal situation we want it to look busy like this so we're going to show that in a way to inspire others even if it's not quite accurate because we want it to look like this is how we want everyone to be and it's uplifting and it inspires people and it empowers people go oh great I want to be like that and that was the message that I was fully supportive of if you have to bend the truth a little bit to get that oh well right that that's not what's important what's important is we're trying to clear the planet that was my thinking at least that's great i'm so glad you explained that because i've i've thought about that over the years over many years you always see these scenes that where they've overdone it they've got too many extras if they make the org look like it's so hopping and you're like yeah that was they they clearly set that up that's not how things are um, but like you say, you want to believe it anyway. So e- e- even though, I mean, I knew it was fake and I wasn't involved in it, but even though you were, you recruited those people to be on that screen, you still felt like, yeah, but the message is what matters. Yeah, it was, it was all about what we were doing and what we're trying to do. Not necessarily, you know, the, the whole event is geared towards um marketing to Scientologists is not a public event to try and get people in it's trying to keep people in Scientology inspired and giving money and taking part so it's just all about the message of like look it doesn't it doesn't really matter what the numbers are as long as we're trying our best and yes we have to be upstart because of ethics and all of this um but we're not going to do that if the event is filled of real imagery of half empty orgs and saying isn't it great we got three people walk in this week in london and last year there were only two <laughs> you know that doesn't inspire people so if you say there was like a a hundred percent increase in followers or people walking in that makes you think oh wow we are doing something good here right. um and that inspires you to carry on because when i was in at least it was just It didn't really matter the reality. It just mattered what we were trying to do. It was the goal that was inspiring. But I can't speak for all Scientologists. I don't know if everyone thinks this. It's just how I felt. I think that's probably a pretty common sentiment, though. Mm. Well, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Bookseller, um, about something random. I don't know how familiar you are with this American figure, Joy Villa. But uh, I recognize the name. But yeah, we start. I started. Gosh, I I think the first Pope uh, picture. I posted of her was in 2013. So 10 years ago, I first noticed they were featuring this woman on their um, publications um, as, of course, they're always dying for young people, right? So she was young. I think she's mixed race. She was an aspiring singer. She was around Celebrity Center, that kind of thing. And, um, And she dressed over the top and she called herself Princess Joy Villa. So we thought this was a lot of fun, right? Well, then um, when Trump was elected uh, in 2016 and he was inaugurated in January 2017, the Grammys happened, I think, early February. So Trump had been president for maybe like two weeks. 
And she shows up at the Grammys. Remember, she's like a aspiring musical artist wearing this dress that's got Trump all over it. And <clears throat> this was still, you know, very early at that time. And artists were not flocking to Trump. And overnight, she became very successful because, you know, conservatives tend not to have that many, you know, celebrities in Hollywood, that kind of thing. So she really wrote it. I mean, she got herself to the White House a couple of times. And she actually explored running for Congress. And of course, I'm just loving it because, you know, when do you have a Scientologist doing all these things so publicly? Yeah. And I mean, she got, uh, she was hanging out with all of Trump's cronies and stuff. And then she just disappeared. And after some time, she shows up at a Dianetics book and, um, you know, stress test table in Brighton. What? <laughs> <laughs> Brighton. Exactly. What what could wow. be going on? That's so strange. I have no was she in the Sea Org? No. No. I don't I honestly don't know. I will have to look into it and find out because I do have a couple of connections down in Brighton um who aren't in anymore but would have been in around that time. So I'll have to ask. But I have no idea. It could have been that maybe she did join the Sea Org or something and then was posted to on a Is mission or something. Is it possible for or... Publix to do a kind of a men's thing and be assigned to a public yeah. table? Yeah, or it could just be she was visiting Bryson on a holiday or something and just happened to walk by and had some free time and they managed to convince her to come out bookselling for the day or something. You know, we we did that before, not necessarily celebrities, but people who don't normally come book selling we'd, or who only bought the book a couple of days ago, we'd be like, look, come out with us, just have a bit of fun and see what we do. Um, and then hopefully use that to recruit them later to sell books with us. But it could have just been something like that. Um, I don't know. I will look into it and see what I can find. Well, I'm glad you say you're going to look into it because that's the other thing I wanted to mention today was that uh, you've been finding some really cool stuff. I think we've had some fun trading stuff with each other. I want people to know you have a website, scientologybusiness.com. You've been doing some great stories over there in the UK. And I I really like the way your uh, news organization and, and our news organization here are, have been cooperating and having fun. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the support. I think this is the thing that I personally to me, I'm always the sort of person that likes to collaborate. And I think we're better, not just in Scientology stuff, but in general, people are stronger when they work together and work not against each other. Right. And so I'm a big believer in getting other people on board and helping each other as much as you can. And so with this Scientology business thing it actually came from Jeffrey Augustine of Scientology Money Project said, hey, you because I was asking him loads of stuff I was researching Cosrecki the UK setup and I was sending him stuff and asking him and he was like Alex you should just start your own website doing this because I focus on the US and I know it very well um but I don't have the greatest understanding of UK law and European and Commonwealth and um you know I think you would be better at doing that and covering it because you were there and you understand it. And I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And after a bit of persistence, I, I did eventually start it um, in August. And the whole idea is not a personal blog talking about my experiences or interviews, but just looking at the facts, reporting on their financial activities, their shell companies, their legal victories and, and losses in the UK, Europe, Commonwealth, um, and kind of trying to be a bit more, reputable as a source of news and information about Scientology in this part of the world. Um, and I think that the more we can work together, the better, because we can share stories and, you know, it, it, we help each other and we get more information, we work together, and then we are more effective at what we're both trying to do. And I'm not in competition with Jeffrey or you because we all have our own angles and takes. So I think it's mutually beneficial for everyone. I encourage more people to start doing similar blogs and websites and stuff if they've got something to say well it's been very um, beneficial for us you've shared some wonderful things with me i really appreciate it thank and you and you mentioned something that is is probably should be your white whale and that is cosrecki and for those people that don't know what alex means by that it was brian seymour 
wonderful Brian Seymour in Australia who first educated me about Kosrecki. And what that means, it stands for Church of Scientology. Uh, I used to know it. <laughs> what is it? Church of Scientology Religious Education College Incorporated. Right. Okay. And, you know, Scientology does not have charity status in the UK. So what it does is it borrows Scientology's charity status in Australia by using an Australian address for its official UK body, which is Cosrecki, this funny corporate name. And Brian Seymour found out that the address they use in Australia to get around paying taxes in the UK is a farm in South <laughs> South Australia, and the farmer had no idea. Yeah, it's it's outrageous, and it's such a clear example of what Scientology do, skirting the lines of what is legal and what isn't, and knowing the loopholes just to get around stuff. When that story came out, they did change the, the registered address is now the org in Adelaide, um, but it is an entity that exists and operates in um, Australia, but it only sorry it exists in australia but it only operates in the united kingdom so instead of having a different organization or company for each org like london birmingham manchester they all go through this one company cosrecki and it doesn't give them tax benefits here because they still have to pay corporation tax and such on their profits um but it does allow them to um jump through a few income tax related loopholes in Australia. And it also allows them to change the numbers they report of how much money they're making and spending from British pounds to Australian dollars and then to US dollars. So there's a lot of room for some um, uh, creative accounting um, in the setup. Um, but because it's a it's the whole of the UK, it's a really good picture of the state of the, the group in the country. And they have to report as a charity really detailed accounts and how they spend their money exactly on what, you know, how much they spent on rent and buildings, on staff wages. And so I've been delving down this rabbit hole and it paints a very interesting picture because Recky borrows money from Church of Scientology International, from Celebrity Center International and from FLAG. Um, it's, they loan Cosrecki money and Cosrecki pays it back with interest, which means they can account less um, profit, which means they pay less tax in the UK, um, but also means that the tax exempt US Church of Scientology is profiting from loaning a hundred million dollars to an overseas entity. And so that begs the question, at what point does um, Scientology become the first tax exempt bank? Very good, very good. I think you need to keep pulling that string, man, because that's one that's been hanging out there for a long time. And I've always wanted to dig into that a little bit more about the game and family. Oh, there's all kinds of fun stuff you're gonna be doing. I'm really excited about that. And it's certainly taken over my life in a way I never expected. You know, when I started speaking out, I thought I'll do a few videos and speak to some people. And here we are like six months later, and I'm basically doing this full time. And um, I've got to the place in my mind where I'm not just, you know, recovering from my experience, but I actively want to try and prevent other people from joining and help other people get out. So I was responsible for getting a lot of people into Scientology and now I feel almost a duty to help people get out um, if I possibly can. And if I can help one person leave Scientology or start their th critical thinking process and questioning what they've been through, that makes it all worth it. And if I have the ability to do this full time, um, I'm going to take it while I can. And so I'm just trying to do as much as I can on YouTube, on Scientology business with the protest. And I can assure you, I'm only just getting started. This yeah. is only just the beginning. That's great. Did you hear from Charlie Wackley when you left? Charlie and I have been in and out of communication over the years. I last heard from him a few months ago um, after I started speaking out, I think before he realized I was speaking out. Um, yeah, we've had on and off chats. Um, I think the last conversation I had with him was talking about my return program, how to get back in the org, um, asking how much money I've got on account. Um, and 
him just clarifying a few of those things and then talking about his property business and asking if I have any property in London that I could sell him. And I was like, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just general chit chat like that. But there was definitely a time when he was heavily involved in trying to keep me on staff and trying to get me back and so on. He was my best mate and we spent all day, every day together for years. And um, I don't know if you saw the piece I wrote on my website a couple of weeks ago that was talking about Charlie reaching OT3. He now knows the Xenu story. Um, and I ended that with a message to him. Not that I believe he will ever see it, but just in case he does, just saying to him, look, dude, if you ever question it or you have doubts or you just need a break, um, my number hasn't changed. I'm in the same place. You know how to contact me. I won't try and convince you to leave. And regardless of any disagreements we've had or what you might think of me, I will be there in 15 minutes if you call me whatever time of day or night. And I just wanted to get that message across if he does receive it, that like, this is where I'm at now. I just want to help people um, not go on a tirade attacking people's beliefs. That's not why I'm doing it, you know? And that sounds so reasonable and compassionate. And the Scientologist would say co covert hostility. I've got he's a got dagger a behind he's my He's got back. a knife behind his back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But hey ho, you know, Scientology like to say lots of funny things like that. Their response to my Guardian article uh, was that I was only in for a few weeks um, in Scientology, which I just found hilarious. Um, yeah, so their, their statement in response was um, this whole campaign of protesting is harassment and it's orchestrated by an anti-Scientologist trying to exploit uh, the few weeks he spent in Scientology over a decade ago. And of course, they're always going to say stuff like this. I was expecting it. But I just found that particular excuse really funny because I have certificates from my time on staff that are dated. And it's very clear for, and easy for me to evidence that I was in for more than a couple of weeks. So why didn't they come up with another lie that they could potentially substantiate evidence for or whatever that wouldn't be so easily disproven? But it's just another example of how Scientology publicly lies in an attempt to um, intimidate, harass and silence critics and former members. Well, it's going to be fun in a, in a week to see what they come up with then. So I hope the bunker can get involved with you on that. We'll talk about that later, see if we can come up with something, some ideas. And uh, thanks uh, for, for uh, telling us about this. I'm excited. I think it's going to be great. Thank you for having me. And anyone who wants to take part in the protest that isn't in the UK, can I'll be live streaming on YouTube. So go look up Apostate Alex and I'll be live streaming the whole thing and you can take part in the live chat and there'll be a bunch of people here. We'll be having a good fun, a uh, good fun time. And obviously we'll be reporting on it and stuff as well afterwards. So yeah, thank you for having me so much, Tony. I appreciate it. All right, Alex. Thank you very much.